I've just started by breaking my microphone, so that's a good failure to start off with. Yeah, uh, thanks for the intro. So yeah, I uh, run an agency called Koto. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about making a logo that looks like a vagina and the internet hating you and it being <laughs> the top trending topic on Twitter for 12 hours, even though that would be a really good subject to talk about and uh, me almost having a breakdown as a result. But um, what I am going to talk about is uh, a lesson in failure or how I learned to be better by being rubbish at first. Um, and I think uh, this is really simply based around the fact that I think you go and see lots of designers speak or people who are creatives or artists and you think that they've come up with a good idea and they've done well and it's kind of turned out for them. Uh, but actually, some people really struggle at first, which is where I, uh, I came into it. So uh, these days, I do things that look a little bit like this. Um, but back in 2001, I graduated from university with a 2-1, and I thought I was going to design CD covers, because that was quite big at the time, even though the, uh, they were obviously dying. Uh, it didn't really turn out like that, unfortunately. Um, and it took me three years to find a, a job that I liked, um, and I didn't really know how to deal with it at the time. So start at the beginning, uh, I worked at a company called Harriman Steel, who are still around these days and incredibly well respected. Um, and I worked there for six months as an intern, and they paid me £100 a week, which was fine, apart from my rent was £105 a week, so I was already losing at life. Uh, and I hadn't quite worked out how that worked, so basically built up a really big credit card bill. But, you know, don't worry about that at that time, because you're 21 and you just kind of uh, soldier through it. Um, and every Friday, they would tell me whether I was coming in on Monday, and then one Friday in November, when it was a really shit, horrible day, they told me I wasn't coming in on Monday, so... Suddenly, I was unemployed, and I was 105 pounds down a week rather than being 100 pounds down a week. Um, and then someone took pity on me and gave me a job, and it was quite a weird job, if I'm honest. Uh, this is MQ magazine, which is Masonic Quarterly, uh, and <laughs> I hadn't really expected life to turn out like this at this point. But you know, you kind of take what you're going. And basically, what had happened was I graduated from university in a company that Matt mentioned called Deep End had offered me a job, and I was like, I'm in here, I've got a job. And then Deep End went bust. And I remember I sent an email to a guy called Simon who'd offered me the job at Deep End, and I got an out of office saying, we've gone bust. <laughs> Fuck off, basically. Uh, and I was like, cool, that's a bit shit. And then I went and did the internship. And basically, the dot-com, uh, which I imagine some of you won't know about, but anyway, it was like a big crash. Everything went wrong. People didn't really want to spend money on creative. So I went to work with the Masons um, and got asked to join the Masons by a guy called Lord Northampton, who, I know this is being videoed, but hopefully he doesn't look at it as nice, that scariest man I've ever met in my life. He basically <laughs> has hell in his eyes. Uh, uh, and I was 21, and I was talking about repositioning the Masons, and I went to... <laughs> and I went... I went to the Grand Lodge, and I was in the Grand Lodge, and the best way to deal with things when you're 21 and you don't really know what you're doing is you get drunk, and you think, fuck it, I'm in the Grand Lodge, I'm never going to come here again. So I went for a wander, and tried loads of doors, and found some weird rooms, found some weird stuff. It was generally weird. Anyway, I, uh, I was the art director of Masonic Quarterly, and the thing that's really annoying about this magazine was the MQ was meant to move around each corner, uh, uh, which was kind of like as, as creative as I got at that time. Uh, and I did it once, and they went, we can't have it moving, and it's like, oh, fuck. So anyway, that was that. Um, and then I went to work at an ad agency that doesn't exist anymore that's called Cuba. That's the Cuban flag. I lasted three months in advertising. It was a total fucking disaster. They don't care about typography. They don't give a shit about color values. They didn't care about anything. I hated everyone that worked there. The culture was zero. Uh, and I got... Uh, I got, basically got my keys taken off me when I'd once worked for 72 hours and I'd forgotten to ask permission whether I was allowed to leave or not. So anyway, that basically taught me everything that I never wanted to be in life. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's watched uh, an incredible program on Netflix called Chef's Table. Anyway, Dan Barber's one of the people on Chef's Table. This is one of the things he says in the program. And it's really, really important in my career that I went somewhere where I realized that I never wanted to be ever again. And basically, that was a real turning point for me. But at the point, I walked out of the ad agency because basically I walked in one morning and they gave me, said, can I have my keys back? And I was like, right, fuck this. I'm done with this. I gave them the keys, told them to fuck off, and I found myself unemployed again, which is not really where you want to be aged 
22 or 23. Um, anyway, all really necessary, because out the back of that, I then went back to where I worked before, did Masonic Quarterly again, which was better than working at the ad agency, uh, and then was like, you know what, you need to get your head around this and you need to go and find a job. So I went to work at Office Shoes, and that was amazing, because as much as it was in-house, and I've been told that in-house is rubbish, I got to do this, which was the Offspring rebrand, which was the first job I was ever proud of, which still stands to this day. It's been a little bit diluted, but it's still there. It was trainers. I love trainers. I had a credit card bill that was full of trainers. Uh, at the time, I was doing a lot of internal stuff, and the CEO at the time of, of Office said to me, you can pitch, but you've got to do it out of hours, and you're pitching against lots of really well-respected agencies. That was like an incredible motivation to me. So anyway, in the end, I pitched against Comran, and me on my own beat Comran, uh, which I was pretty happy about. And I can still remember, he said to me before I went in for my into the pitch, I'll show you their deck before you go in so you can see it, which is pretty nice. And they'd done a logo with antlers on top of it, and I was like, I'm going to beat that. That's terrible. That's absolute <laughs> bullshit. So, uh, but I was still really rough around the edges and a bit of an idiot. Uh, and these are 10 reasons why. So number one, Self-awareness is a really important part of your life. You need to realize into, when you walk into a room and you're trying to sell something, that if you're being a moron, you need to work out you're being a moron and you need to stop being a moron. Uh, I was quite bad at that when I was 21. Number two, one of my nicknames is The Mouth. It's for a reason. I've got a great big gob. When you're 21 and you're asking constant questions, you're an annoying dick. When you're 36 and you're a creative director, it's really important. Number three, network. I thought all the best jobs were in the back of Creative Review in 2001. It turns out they're not. It's about who you know is in life. Uh, I didn't really understand that at the time, and I look back on that now and I feel pretty thick. Uh, number four, fashion is a really important part of what we deal with every day. When I came out of university, everyone hated a book called Smile in the Mind because it was all about ideas and being witty and being clever. And so therefore, I hated Smile in the Mind. It actually turns out that the way that my mind works and the way that I think is actually more like Smile in the Mind than Designers Republic, who were big at the time. Uh, and it's about knowing yourself and understanding who you are. Number five, I was always waiting for the perfect brief because it's a really good excuse because you look at that brief and go, oh, it's not quite right, it's not what I want it to do, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. Bollocks, every brief is perfect. Uh, number six, I was absolutely petrified by failure when I was uh, young because I had an ego, but the ego wasn't justified. I wanted to be really good at what I did because I really, really cared about it and I believed it was my calling in life. And so therefore it totally crippled me and I ended up in a situation where I just did nothing and pretended to be a bit aloof and a bit cool because I'd spent 120 quid on my credit card and some trainers. Um, that's Napoleon, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, I didn't really have a strategy. and You've got to have a strategy in life. It's really important to have a strategy. Now he had a strategy and he conquered the whole of Europe. My strategy was... I'm just going to be a bit aloof and a bit cool and think that everything's below me. It doesn't really work. Uh, and I was just making for making sake re rather than really understanding why I was making, why I was making, and how it made difference to businesses. Um, a weird part of my personality is it's kind of combined with this, which is I'm incredibly pra practical. So as my career went on, I worked with some really good designers, and I knew they were better than me because they were older than me and they had more experience. So I just kind of let them do it, and then I did the bits in between. It doesn't really work like that, but at the time it felt like the right thing to do. For anyone who doesn't know, that's the IKEA man. I'm a big fan of the IKEA man. He appears in the corner and he kind of tells you how to build things. Basically, my happy place in life is building IKEA furniture. Um, number nine, ethic versus application. I'm rushing a bit because I've just realized I've talked for eight and a half minutes. Shit. Um, good work is hard. Hard work is good. I totally agree with that, um, but it's one thing having an ethic and understanding what something means. It's another thing applying it and actually acting out on it. And I think we're all guilty in our life every day saying something, but then doing the complete opposite, whether that's in our personal or our professional life. And so in a way, I had a disconnect at that time. Uh, and the final thing is, I think a lot of people see life as a race, and so therefore I've worked in design agencies. And I think what's quite good about design is it's generally changed quite a lot, but back in 2001, there's a lot more ego. You'd hear bad stories from other studios where people were kind of racing each other and kind of like creating work to try and beat each other. And I think I was kind of hoping that I didn't have to get involved in that life. So what changed? I bought this book that cost me $6.99 and is the best book I've ever read in my life. And if you haven't read it and you're in this room, you should read it because it's brilliant. Uh, it's by a guy called Paul Arden, and he was creative director of Saatchi and Saatchi. 
And I think what's interesting about this book is that as it's become more popular, people think, oh, it's not for me because it doesn't really contain things. But it's absolutely, literally, the only book that most people in creatively, creative industry should start with. Uh, best Paul Arden quote he ever said, we are all advertising all of the time, even the priest, with all of his or her fever, is advertising God. Now that, for me, sums up the fact that when people are rude about advertising, they haven't got a fucking clue what they're talking about. How did I change? I learned to edit. I found new methods that suited me as a person. And I started with why. It's the most important thing. Why do we do the things that we do every day? This is called the Peter Principle. It's a management uh, principle. I think most people that work in design think that if you're really good at design or you're really good at branding or whatever you're working in, that's enough. It's not. Load of bollocks. This is what it's about. Most people do something that's called promoting to failure. So you're successful at being a junior designer, you become a middleweight designer. You're successful at that, you become a senior designer. You fail because all of those things to that moment are design. It's about understanding that when you interview someone or you add someone or you work with someone, it's not about what they were, it's about what you want them to be. That to me was a success of becoming successful because I'm better at being the top right-hand corner than I am being the bottom left-hand corner. So what is success at design? I think it's the following. It's actually 30% design, 30% organization, 30% hustle, and 10% God knows what. Hustle is the most important part. You have to walk into rooms and sell things to people that they don't know they want yet, which is why you hire character and you train skill. I always thought that I had to be skillful, but what actually I had to do is I had to have a character that made me who I was. Release myself from the pressure, realize that team is better than individuals, fail, fail again, fail better, as Samuel Beckett said, because essentially you need to make things work for you, not fit into someone else's idea of who you are. Thank you very much.